is a story, a mystery, suspicious. It's attracted all sorts of conspiracy theories, all sorts of questions. It's produced all manner of legal filings. But today we're going to talk about an element of this case that hasn't been discussed as much. There's a policy component to this story now, and I'm joined by Lauren Taylor as we talk about the element of the Micah Miller saga that is starting to really dominate discussion. It's this notion of coercive control of should South Carolina and other states for that matter, look at their domestic violence statutes and rethink the way that they're structured, the way they're enforced. Uh, you deal with a ton of family law law, and we thought you'd be the perfect person to bring in and talk about this. First of all, let's start with the, the basics on the Micah Miller story. There's been so much uh, alleged abuse, harassment, stalking, manipulation, isolating her from family members, all under the guise of spiritual authority. I mean, this guy's a pastor, um, using that term loosely, but Laura, let's just get your baseline thoughts on the Micah Miller case from what you've seen so far. Yeah, well, unfortunately, I think it's one of the saddest um, displays of what I see on a daily basis played out really on an escalated level. Um, and I think that's what has really grabbed the attention of the national uh, media on this case, too. It's just, it's so tragic. She was so beautiful. She did try so many things to leave her situation. So just as an overall, like what is coercive control? So um, this is a, a theory or a, a thought, a, a thought of mind, um, basically where someone doesn't necessarily hit you or abuse you physically. They have a coercive control over your life, which leads to the same consequences. So they might not allow you to go to the grocery store or monitor your phone calls, um, really isolate you from your friends and family. Um, really coercive control is chipping away at every little part of you that makes you, you an independent person and putting all that down to where you can't function as a human without this abuser. You need them to, to live, right? So in our state, while we do still have the right to do what's called a no-fault divorce, um, we also have fault-based grounds. Um, and one of the fault-based grounds in South Carolina is physical cruelty. A lot of clients come to me that are in like a situation where at least so far with what the family has put out there, I don't think that the abuse escalated to physical, um, at least not habitually. So we don't have kind of a little cutout in South Carolina right now that covers emotional abuse, which is really where coercive control would fall under. And, you know, sometimes that is so frustrating because you don't ever want to look at a client that's coming to you. You know, if Micah Miller was sitting in my office telling me, what she was experiencing with her husband, I don't ever want to have to say, well, we have to wait for him to hit you before we can do anything. So I think that is what is arising out of this and Micah's law that um, I believe Regina Ward is working to try to get passed. I know that South Carolina, we're sixth in the country for domestic violence. We we have huge problem with that in our state. Now, while we do have some laws on the books that, you know, regulate if you've been convicted of a domestic violence offense, your right to own a firearm is suspended for, I believe, two years. Um, it, it's not enough. And I think that's what we're seeing here is the side of things. And in today's society, it's a lot easier to control someone and to manipulate the situation. And if they don't have a bruise on their arm or they don't have a black eye, it's harder to get anyone else to believe you and not just believe you, but it's harder to get proof. And when we're in the realm of family court, they have to sift through so many things to try to figure out what is the truth of the matter here. And unfortunately, whether lawyers are advising people of this or whether it's just the nature of who we are as a society, the worst actors can use family court to further that abuse. They can actually continue the abusive process with the help of family court through if, the system. Through the yeah. system, if they play it, you know, accurately. For example, Mr. Miller, um, I believe it's alleged by Micah's family that he had her involuntarily committed. That is a terrifying situation, and I'm certainly not speaking about it to give anyone any ideas. But in in this state, if you are married to someone or a family member, and you feel as though that person is a direct threat to themselves or others, you can call the Department of Mental Health and they will be picked up for a 72 hour hold. During that time, they're mentally evaluated and they're trying to determine if they're fit to reenter society. Um, during that 72 hours, you know, they might decide, hey, you are nuttier than peanut butter jar. You know, we've got to get you some serious help here. 
or they could decide you don't have anything that's wrong with you. In most cases, when situations like Micah has happened, there are a lot of things going on that might not make you super happy. You might be going through anxiety, depression. I mean, leaving an abusive situation, it takes the average woman seven times before she actually can successfully leave that scenario. So yeah, our mental health state isn't going to be great in that scenario anyways. And for someone to capitalize on that by having her hospitalized, which I'm sure is in the cell traumatic experience to be put in a police car and taken to a mental health hospital where you can't leave for three days. Um, that's a, that's the, that's him using the system to further his abuse and his coercive control. And then while she was in the facility, you know, disposing of her vehicle and all of that stuff. So there's a need to... Well, and worse than that, allegedly seizing a lot of the evidence that she had collected uh, against him to sort of... Her make- diaries and things like that. And that's the problem when... And, and I have to sit every day across from women that come with similar stories. And, you know, I give them all the same advice. Keep keep a book of every single thing that happens every time there's a nasty text message or a nasty email or, you know, a threatening act, like just document it because your brain is so overwhelmed at that time. And you're thinking about self-preservation. You're thinking about protecting your children. You're terrified about your financial state. You're terrified over whatever this person is telling you, which is probably not truths or things designed to further scare you into not leaving the situation. So when we talk about having legislation fill that gap, um, I think it's something that's important. But on the other side of it, we have to look at enforceability. Um, and also like, you know, the, the family court is a court that is congested. Um, they're dealing with child protective service cases. They're dealing with DSS cases. They're dealing with ch- juvenile, you know, criminal cases. So when we enact a law that would make it illegal for someone to stalk someone or have control over their or isolate them from their friends and family. I can see the need from that just from my own experience with these women. But I can also see on the flip side of that how an abuser could use that law to help themselves or use that. I mean, I, I half the time whenever I get someone who has been abused, there's at least one police report where the abuser said that the victim hit them. And, and once you've gotten in the mud there, now everybody's, you know, guilty here. And the family court judge who doesn't know you and doesn't know your spouse or the father of your child or the mother of your child. I mean, there, there's women that are doing this to men as well. This is not, you know, an only female crime. Um, when you're asking someone like that to make decisions that have an impact on your family forever, it's scary. And it's mm-hmm. scary to try to legislate something like that. Um, But without legislation, you know, we won't have a way to enforce it. So far, I know that um, Canada, UK and Australia have laws on the books regarding coercive control. In the US, I believe it's Hawaii and California that have some semblance of that, which interestingly enough, um, when I was reading up on this, Hawaii has actually seen, I believe, a 15% decrease in their domestic violence rates since they've put this law on the books. So there's you know, research to indicate that this will have a reduction in the amount of domestic violence instances that you have in a state that passes it. But, you know, just like everything else, you can't just pass a bill and think that's going to solve the issue here. How do we enforce the law? How do we simplify the court system to where now we're not just sitting here having motions over, you know, did he follow me home from school or he, you know, is stalking me because he picked the kids up at daycare at the same time I did. There's going to be a lot of frivolous things that are filed that you have to sift through to find the actual real victims of the course of control. Well, let me ask you this. I, I wanted to, obviously Micah's case is an outlier, certainly in the outcome and the depth of alleged depravity on the part of John Paul Miller. I mean, you read what the families put out. You read some of these family court filings that have been submitted, one by his former wife, alleging all manner of, of, of sexual abuse, uh, some involving underage uh, victims. I mean, it is just some horrific stuff. And and just what the family has released about the alleged uh, harassment and intimidation and isolation of Micah. Uh, but the tactics whether shutting off finances, whether you know the trackers, the PIs, uh, the taking of the you know private images and videos and threatening to release them, 
that's not an outlier. That stuff happens all the time, right? It does. And we do have laws on the books, you know, for revenge porn and, um, you know, financial abuse is, it's not a carved out fault-based ground for divorce in South Carolina, but it is something that family court judges will look at as a factor when, you know, we're trying to say, okay, we need someone to leave the house. Um, Because in this state, in order to file, unless you have a fault-based ground, you know, someone has to leave before we can file for divorce. So if we're saying we're scared for her to leave because he controls all of the finances and she doesn't have anywhere to go, um, there's so many layers to this. So we do have laws on the books to protect from some of this stuff, but we can't catch up. If somebody wants to to really wreak havoc on their spouse's life, like allegedly Mr. Miller did to Micah, the court system is, they're still trying to like tie their shoelaces, you know, after the gun went off. So that's, I think it, it's a problem with bureaucracy and like, we can't just write a law. We have to write a law that's actually enforceable and people understand how it's enforceable and how is it going to be practically applied when it actually is in front of judges and they're asked to look at facts and determine, you know, what is going to be applicable. That's where we really have to get creative and really have conversations with the family court bar. Like, that's what I would like to see the legislature do is like bring in people that are doing this every day ask us Have what are, what are the strategies that we're seeing you testify used? before a legislative I would love, panel I would about. love to I would love to um and really like as a community and jurists like let's come together and try to solve this problem like no one's in favor of domestic violence I think we can all agree it's a bipartisan issue um and and it's one that's going to continue to get worse until there's something done to stop it and I think we're we're placed in a unique situation with the horrific events of Micah Miller, let's not let it be for naught. Yeah.